Welcome to For the Church, a podcast for the flock of Zion Presbyterian Church in Columbia, Tennessee. We want to help you think biblically about everyday matters. Zion Church exists to join Jesus and his mission to reach people with the gospel and then equip his people to worship and serve. I'm your host, Keaton Paul, and joining me is my conversation partner and co-host, Seth Scruggs. In our current moment of Zion's history, we're on a journey to find a new lead pastor. This is an exciting time, but also one that can raise questions and concerns. In this season, we're asking, hopefully answering some of those questions of what is a pastor and what makes a good one? Uh, how do we know one when we see one? And over the the next episode or two and the previous episodes, we've been in a, a, a sub-series, if you will, called Pastor Profiles. And today in particular, we're, we're asking... Um, and looking at what a pastor is as enduring for the gospel. But before we do that, hey, Seth, how are you? Hey, Keaton. I, when you looked at me, I was thinking about what our, our friend uh, Logan Peck said in yes. Life Group the other night, where he said that whenever you ask me that, I always just say, good, yeah, and then move um, as quickly onto the actual topic. Right. As possible. Yeah. So yeah. I'm doing good. Anyway, so I'm really excited about... <laughs> No, I'm doing really good. It's it's a nice nice fall day. It's a Cup nice fall day. Yeah, just really good. It like I said last time, it's just it's always uh, a good time when I get to spend an hour with Keaton. I you know I I hope that's true. Um, I enjoy this a whole lot. Uh, it's a it's a great outlet, I guess, for uh the the, the pent up nerd energy that I have it's a it's a way of getting it out so that my wife doesn't have to listen to me literally talk about this at home all the time all the time yeah all the time constantly and you know so it's um yeah. if if nothing else it's been it's been great for my marriage <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's good for me because um I I do not have nearly the church history knowledge that you do. And most people don't. Well, um, if we're, if we're honest, but I, I just don't have that kind of, uh, the, the same depth of knowledge. Um, and I, I, so I really appreciate being able to hear from you on these things and gain, gain some wisdom from you. These have been, these have been fun. You know, there are in upcoming seasons, we probably will shift gears that won't be quite so church history heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you're if you're listening and you're bored by yes. the amount of church history, there there are other things that we will talk about at some point. Right. Yeah, we have things coming down the pike that will be that will be less church history heavy. Um kind of like it or not. Now if you're just like if you want more church history, then we could probably swing some of that too in in future seasons. So yep. <laughs> let us know in an email. <laughs> <laughs> Keaton.paul at PCSIN.org. There we go. It's in the show notes. Um, but yeah, these are great. Yeah. Much fun. So let's dig into this one. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm interested. This one, um, you know, last week was one that I was like, yeah, I kind of get where we're going right. with this. Um, I, I don't really know where we're going with this one. Yeah. Totally. So I'm, I'm excited to hear kind of your take on this. Yeah. So, you know, with the pastoral uh, pastor profiles, what we're... What we're really asking are, are what are some good models for what a pastor should be? And, you know, we've looked at, you know, the pastor is a physician of the soul. That makes sense. Pastor is the preacher. That makes sense. Um, pastor is the leader of the church in a never-changing world. That makes sense. What I wanted to look at, though, in this one um, is the fact, um, you know, and maybe this is almost uh, – a part two, a sub sub series, a part two <laughs> to last week's, uh, because the the call for a pastor to endure for the gospel uh, is something that's just full of, of of scripture. You know, take for instance, First um, Corinthians fifteen fifty eight says this: Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your na- your labor is not in vain. It, that language of, of of steadfastness, the the Greek word, since I'm not 
Um, you know, I don't like to to actually say Greek words from the pulpit because um, it's pretentious and it doesn't help. Um, and so I won't say it here. But another way to um, uh, to kind of translate that word is is long suffering. And um, you know, if if you kind of have a little bit of Greek knowledge. Uh, you can almost hear it or see it in the word hupomone. Like there's this, there's this long, long suffering steadfastness, kind of constantly able to to withstand opposition in a beautiful way. Here's another one. Paul says, First uh, First Timothy six verse eleven. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. He was talking about the false teachers and whatnot before, but but instead do this: pursue righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. And so what we're getting at there really it is one of the one of the things that a pastor has to be is somebody that is rooted and steadfast. There has to be while while living in a world that's constantly changing, um, a pastor has to be somebody that's so deeply and rooted uh, deeply grounded and rooted that in the times of persecution, in the times uh, of difficulty, um, they're able to withstand. And even that language of shepherd, um, which we've talked about you know, from the very beginning, um, as a shepherd, you will have to fight wolves. It's just going to happen. Um, you will have to fend off the, the bears from the flock. It's going to happen. And what those look like are innumerable. Um, and, and sometimes in the process you get, you know, you get bit and you get attacked and, uh, and you get your feelings hurt. Um, and so if you're not, if you don't have kind of your priorities straight, um, as a pastor leading the church and doing long-term work for the faith and for the gospel, uh, you're just not going to make it very long. Yeah, I I really like the word long suffering. I nice? really well, and I like it because you know this kind of goes with what we talked about last week. But that idea that like in a lot of times in our culture is all about like what's the best job? Yeah, and I'm gonna move on to the next thing, yeah. and and kind of like always looking for the the better thing, right? You know, and long suffering, you know. Obviously, it says suffering, but it, 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 I don't think about it. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. it doesn't seem to carry the same connotation of like being miserable right. in a place. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't have that. It's this idea that like you are sticking with something because you love it. Yeah, it, and I yeah. almost like it better than steadfast because it's like it's not just when I think about steadfast. And again, maybe this is just me, but when I think about steadfast, I'm thinking about you know. I'm staying in one place as the things hit me. Right. right? I'm not moving. Right. Whereas long suffering and endurance yeah. and um, you know, you you have on here you know, running the race. Yeah. You know, as as another kind of metaphor for right. it. Those have this idea of like pushing through. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I really like that that, you know, I think as we're as we're thinking about a new pastor mm-hmm. coming. I think that someone who's long, long suffering, who's in it for the long haul. Yeah, exactly. Um, to put it another way, right? You know, we've we have a history of people who have been here for a while. Yep. And I think that that as we're thinking about that moving forward, that's what we're looking for, right? right. Like we're looking for someone who is in it for the long haul. Right. Who's gonna be here through, you know, whatever comes. Absolutely. Um. And so yeah, I really like that word. I'm a word nerd. Yeah. So I like that kind of stuff. No. And I, and I get, I, I think that you're, you're right there too. Um, you know, and part of this is it, you know, to, in a countercultural sort of way in a world where like, you know, we hate to put it this way, but like church shopping and church hopping are, are so prominent where kind of Christians, you know, yeah, I'm not feeling this one now. We'll move to something else or, or, you know, just in a generally, uh, uh, the highly, highly mobile society in which we live, um, the thought of a pastor 
staying in one place for a really long time through thick and thin is really refreshing. Right. Um, well, and uh, yes, yeah. you know, somewhere like Zion, um, which is a relatively small church right. in the scheme of churches. Yeah. 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 It is, um, as Paul liked to say, not sexy, right? right? Paul Joyner, not Paul, the apostle. Yeah. You know, it's not sexy. It's not, it's not super exciting Yeah. in a, in a, uh, worldly presentational sense. Right. And so to say, yeah, I'm going to spend 15 to 20 years of my life at Zion yeah. is not, you know, it's not going to like impress people. Right. Like when you go right. home for your, your class reunion, it's not going to impress people to be like, yeah, I'm a pastor of like a church of 250, <laughs> 300 people. And we, we have, nope. like, you know, we are in a little, you know, it's like, it's, it's not, it's just, right. and, and, that's okay. Yeah. And that's good. Obviously we're here because we love Zion and right. we love this church. We love the church, but this church especially yeah. you know, for, for different reasons. But um, yeah. So I think the idea of endurance yeah. in that in saying, yeah, I'm not worried about what other people are going to say. I'm worried about, you know, what God has called me to. Yeah and pursuing that call and being in it for the long haul. Right. That's huge. Yeah, it is. You know, and, um, it, and maybe two examples, uh, can really kind of help, you know, cause, cause on, on the front end, you're like, well, you're just mainly talking about like a pastor here, but when you hear kind of the fruit that comes from minist- ministries that are exemplified by long suffering or, or steadfastness, you go, Oh wait, no, I do want that pastor. Um, and just thinking of, of, you know, examples of pastors who, who have been long suffering, I think first and foremost, um, one that comes to my mind is, uh, the, the great Athanasius, um, you know, 296 or so, we're not real sure when he was born, 296 between then and maybe 298, somewhere around there, um, dies in 373, um, as a, becomes Bishop of Alexandria, um, and is a young man not a bishop, um, when the Council of Nicaea occurs. He was um, an assistant to the current bishop of, of Alexandria at the Council of Nicaea. So he was there for it all, um, staunchly on uh, the side of what becomes known as Nicene Orthodoxy. He was a firm, firm believer um, in the doctrine of the Trinity uh, as given to us um, from the Bible and then expounded in the Nicene Creed. Um, but spends the bulk of his life uh, wrestling and fighting with uh, the Arians because even after you know Nicaea happens and and we think oh once for all yeah okay good you know doctrine of the Trinity is is articulated Arianism is, is gone the idea that Jesus is is sort of a I, <laughs> I was talking about this with some students here a while back and they're like oh got it the Arians believe that. Um, that Jesus is, is uh, divine adjacent. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Yes, that's, yes, that's a good way to translate that into to your language. And so Athanasius is staunchly opposed to the idea that Jesus is divine adjacent or that he's, he's sort of divine, you know, the firstborn of all creation um, to, to kind of steal from Paul, but not mean what Paul means. And, um, you know, in doing so, uh, that that theology flourishes in and around Athanasius's day and time, even after the Council of Nicaea, because it was just very ingrained in the culture of the day um, and in the songs, interestingly enough, of the day. And so um, Athanasius is banished from, he's made uh, bishop shortly after the Council of Nic- Nicaea. He's banished from Alexandria, Egypt, um, shortly after he's made bishop and will spend the bulk, I think I want to say it's like four or five times, maybe more, um, that he's banished, uh, and lives in exile or has to flee one of the two, um, because the Arians are seeking to kill him. Um, and and yet he, he, you know, he'll, he'll do the thing where he, he flees to the desert. He's there the whole time though. All he can think about it is his flock. You know, um, this group is going to try to kill him. 
but all he wants to do is get back home in order to serve the church. And, um, and so he'll, he'll spend actually more years fleeing, uh, more years in sojourning in exile, um, as Bishop than he will as Bishop in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and yet it's his constancy of, yeah, uh, the world, you know, one of his famous lines is, you know, um, allegedly at least somebody says, you know, Athanasius, so how does it feel, um, to have the whole world against you? And he, he looks at the crowd and says, oh no, it's not, it's not the world against Athanasius. It's Athanasius against the world. And, uh, it is very fine with that posture. Mm -hmm. Um, it, a, a man of, of deep biblical conviction to say, even if the whole world stands in opposition to me, um, I, I believe with all my heart that this is biblical and I can't let it go. Um, and also because I'm a pastor, uh, I can't leave the flock, uh, to be ravaged by the, the wolves. Uh, and so I will, I will fight until there's nothing left, uh, to make sure that the right doctrine of God is taught to my people and that the Bible is rightly taught, um, and even if that means I have to spend the bulk of my life in, in exile, um, so be it. But uh, these are my people, and I'm going to keep showing up. Yeah. I I think your two things really in there you hit on that I think really speaks to kind of what we're digging into here. Uh, the first is the deep biblical conviction yeah. piece, which is obviously huge. If you're going to be right. a pastor, we want our pastors to have deep biblical convictions. Yeah, totally. um, And in this case, be willing to be exiled and basically lose everything for right. them. Um, it, so I think that's huge. You're right. And then secondly, that deep biblical conviction led to a great love for the people right, and Absolutely. a desire for those people to also have a deep biblical conviction. Right. And, and so I think that, you know, a lot of times there's, there's the stereotype of the seminary student, right? Who's so right. There, uh, I had a, <laughs> yeah. I had a professor in college, a biblical studies professor who would, would talk about how, you know, no one knows more than a first year seminary student. Absolutely. No one knows more. And, and so the point being here, like it it could be, you know, he he could have let that strong biblical conviction um embitter him against those who did not have the same biblical conviction. Yeah, absolutely. You know, who were wrong, who were believing in a heresy. But instead, that strong conviction drove him to have a love for the people. Yeah. And so he wasn't, you know, th- I think that in our day, there are some people who hold certain convictions because they like being right. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? Like, it's, Absolutely. I, I'm going to hold this conviction that not everybody else holds, and sometimes they are right, you know? Right. But, but the, the idea being, I'm going to hold this conviction that not everyone else holds because I'm going to be different and I'm going to be right. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it's yeah. not what Athanasius is doing. Athanasius no. is saying... I'm gonna I'm gonna hold this conviction because it's right. Right. And I just want everyone to see it. Mm. I just want the people to know who God is. Yeah. Right. Right. And the truth of who he is. And yeah. I and I think that's that's huge in that in that kind of way of long suffering. It's not a false form of long suffering. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I Again, bringing up that example of like the people who like to hold convictions that are different than everyone else because they got to be different, right. got to be different, you know, <laughs> totally. They're controversialist. Right. So, yeah, we've got to be different. Um, and, we're, you know, they, they just they enjoy the fight more than they enjoy truth. Right. But I and I think that they would want to see themselves in this idea of enduring for the gospel. Mm. Right. They're enduring for the right thing. Right. But I think at. Athanasius example and I think Paul's example right. and James's you know every you know John uh the apostles example yeah is one that says I'm going to endure for the truth not because I need to be right right not because I'm the one who has to you know hold the flag yeah 
but because this thing is bigger than me. Right. You oh, know, yeah. Paul will even say like, if I come back and I tell you something different, mm-hmm. don't listen to me. Right. This right. is, this is it. Yeah. This is the message. And if I come back and I say something different, I'm wrong and something happened. Yep. Like, yep. so, so he's, it's not about him. It's not about yeah. what attention he can get. Right. And I think it's, it's huge as we, as we think about, what kind of a pastor do we want in our pulpit? Yeah. And right. what kind of a pastor do we want leading our church? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, and, and even on that note, so like, you know, Athanasius lived in a world of, of controversy and I don't think he lived for the fight, but he certainly wasn't afraid of it. Um, mm, and, that's, but, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and he was, he was clearly not afraid of controversy, um, but he wasn't a controversialist. Mm. Uh, and those are two very different things. Um, but this next, so most people probably listening to this have heard of, of Athanasius. This next guy though is probably somebody that m- most people in our sort of, you know, camp haven't heard of. Um, but is a guy who has become, you know, I don't know if I want to say he's on like my, my Mount Rushmore, of uh, of pastors and theologians, but he is a guy that I've gone back to a number of different times. Whenever like when I when when I just have a bad day, the different guys do different things. When I have a really bad day, of uh, you know uh, of you know pastoral ministry or whatever, I preach a total bum sermon, right? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I I should just go do something else, right? <laughs> like I'm wasting everybody's time. <laughs> um, sometimes I just need, or, or, you know, I take some criticism and, you know, somebody brings up uh, a point valid or invalid, doesn't really matter. And I get my feelings hurt, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, woe is me, me as woe. I'm going to go do something else. Um, this is a guy I always come back to and it puts everything in perspective. And, you know, I just, I keep trugging along. His name was Charles Simeon. Charles Simeon was a, um, an Anglican pastor from uh, 1759 through 1836. So, you know, he's uh, he's born the year after Jonathan Edwards dies. Uh, he makes it into, you know, uh, the 1800s. So America is its own thing now. He's witness to all of that. He's born um, and lives almost exactly the same time as William Wilberforce does, um, who you know, legislates for slavery to be abolished in England. His one of Simeon's mentors, maybe from afar, but was John Newton who wrote amazing grace. So that's kind of the the context that he's in alive knows, uh, Wesley. Well met, um, met Whitfield. So he's kind of in that era, but this is a, a particular era of fascination to me moving forward. Um, but Simeon was just, uh, you know, a very interesting guy. He, uh, you know, Grows up in a well-to-do family. His dad's pretty much an atheist at this point. Um, to me, and goes to to Cambridge. Well, he goes to before that in grade school. He goes to really the premier boarding school, um, and then goes to Cambridge. Cambridge at this point in time is we don't think of this a lot, but in the 1700s and early 1800s, um, Cambridge, while it was you know, one of the premier schools, uh, in Britain, it was also a place of all kinds of vileness. Like it was wretched, wretched. Um, so anyway, Charles Simeon goes, shows up to to Cambridge and, you know, he's very much uh, a man of the town. He would probably say, um, and, you know, loves to, to wear the latest fashion and kind of show off. He's also very, very bright um, and uh, pretty athletic, too. So um, participates in all of that. But um, it comes under deep conviction because one of the things uh, at Cambridge during this time is when you were a student, you had to take communion. And even though it's a place of vileness, there's still at this point enough, you know, kind of Christianity hangover to where um he knows what it means to come to the table and so like there's this deep concern of i'm about to eat and drink judgment to myself and so the lord starts doing something in his heart and he has 
he, he starts digging as much as he could. And he talks about, you know, really the only book that he could get a hold of, um, to, to think more on it was this really kind of, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a, uh, of a, <laughs> of a, a similar book of our own time without offending anyone. Uh, no, I just won't. So it's, um, it's a, re- <laughs> just describe the book. Yeah. 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 The we'll book. just describe yeah, it. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. basically, it's, it has, it's a bunch of rules. Um, it's poorly written, but it's still a bestseller cause it, you know, it's written on a popular level. And it kind of scratches an itch for a particular time, but it's not biblical at all. Right. So kind of like a legalist kind of do these things and everything will be okay kind of thing. Yeah. 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 A legalist do these things um, and you'll, you know, all your dreams will come true. You know, right. Kind of thing. right, right, right. So, <laughs> a Joel Osteen book for the lack of a better term. Yep. We, you know, if you're listening to this, you, you know, you, you understand that. So, um, but just can't find anything. Um, and you know, eventually is driven back to scripture and, um, you know, gets converted and he spends three years at Cambridge and he is the only Christian that he knew at Cambridge during the 1700s. So, you know, by the, you know, just let that also be a little bit of perspective. If we, if we feel like we're living in a, in a hyper, you know, secular world, which fair enough, I, I think we could call it that. Um, Charles Simeon in the 1700s was the only Christian he knew at Cambridge for three years. So there's that. Um, but eventually, uh, he, um, he's called to be a a fellow and teach some at at Cambridge. And so he, he does that, but he's also an an evangelical Christian, um, and, and begins to seek ordination in the church to his father's dismay. His dad is really upset about it. Um, and pretty annoyed every time. Simeon comes home. He he demands his his father and his brothers come down for for evening family devotion, uh, family worship, and um, you know they're pretty annoyed by it. But it it happens. Um, he uh, eventually, um, you know, w- one day he's walking across Cambridge and he looks up and there's a, a church. It's still there, um, if you want, but it's kind of tucked away. It's like right next to the you know, kind of the square market and that they have in, um, in the UK, one of the chains. Um, so you'll miss it if you're not paying attention, but, uh, Holy Trinity church, Cambridge. Um, and he walks past it and, and he says, you know, Oh Lord, I'd love to, I would love to be the pastor there one day. And, uh, well, as Providence would have it, um, at the age, ripe old age of 23 or 24, he's made rector in charge uh, of the of Holy Trinity Church. Now, here's the kicker, though. He's made um, the way that the the Anglican system works. Um, unlike us, and if you want more on this, see a previous episode. Uh, how how to get a pastor, something like that. Um, unlike us, congregations don't pick their pastors. Mm. So you know, here we we form a committee. The committee looks at the various candidates. They find one that you know, fits what they're looking for. They present it to the church, they preach, and then there's congregational vote. And it's a very lengthy process, but the congregation is very involved, very involved. In the Anglican system, it doesn't work like that at all. Uh, the bishop over a particular region says, this person will be your pastor. Thumbs up. If you don't like it, I don't care. They're your pastor. And um, by this point, Simeon is ordainable, he wants to be pastor at Holy Trinity Church, and um, Simeon's dad knows people, namely the bishop, even though Simeon's dad's <laughs> an atheist. And so Simeon's dad says, "Hey, my son wants to be the bish- uh, wants to be the pastor there." And the bishop says, "You got it, boss." And so Simeon becomes the pastor. The whole church, though, hates him. They can't stand him um, because uh, Simeon was what what they they called during this time was a derogatory term. He was a Methodist, not a Methodist, how we think of Methodist. Um, but he, what we would call, and actually the later end of his life, what would be called an evangelical. Um, again, probably a little different than what you have in mind. British evangelicals during the, the uh, 19th century, the 1800s are probably different than what you have in mind. That would be a fun thing to do at some point, but we won't do that now. Um, he was an evangelical. He, he believed the Bible. He, um, uh, was very influenced by, 
uh, Whitfield more than than Wesley's theology, um, but knew Wesley well. Was very much mentored from afar by uh, John Newton. Um, all of which who were were very uh, shaped by the Puritans and the Reformers. And so, um, while Simeon didn't like to slap, you know, kind of titles or isms on himself. You know, he was very identifiable as what we might call an evangelical Calvinist um, or you know, somebody um, like J.C. Ryle, who would be just a generation later. Um, so uh, and, and the congregation hated him, like absolutely hated him, was very much opposed to him to the place that um, though he was the pastor during the time, this point in time in uh, the Anglican Church's history, you had your normal kind of Sunday morning service, uh, your pastor preached that, but then you would have sort of a afternoon, evening, what they would call lecture or lectureship. And uh, the the congregation picked who was the lectureship. Um, Simeon would be there a really, really, really long time before he ever had the lectureship. Uh, And even the guy who was doing the lectureship at the time, they wanted him to be the pastor. He didn't get it. He was there for a number of years and then left to take a call at a at a different church, and they still didn't want Simeon to have it. So they went and found like literally a random guy, just some random dude, and they're like, "Hey, you want to do the lectureship?" And the guy was like, "Yeah, sure." Um, well, great, because we hate that guy. So, um, so anyway, um, so Simeon starts to 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 preach, and um, the church basically boycotts. And at this point in time. Pews were set up to where you you rented pews as a family and you could lock them. And so the pew owners, as they were called, locked all the pews in the church every single Sunday. So people couldn't come in and sit. And Simeon was known for for doing very much like um, evangelism of, of sorts, uh, was very involved in the lives of the students. And so he had a lot of people showing up who weren't historically there. Uh, but all the pews were locked. And so he went and spent part of his inheritance on chairs to put in the aisles and in the corners. Uh, and so he did that for a while. Well, the warden of the church uh, threw all of the chairs uh, out in the street. And I think at one point maybe set them on fire. <laughs> like, it's pretty obvious they don't want you here. Well, if that's not enough... Um, you know, because of that, you know, people would still pack house and just stand uh, the whole time he preaches. And, um, you know, he's known for for very biblical, one of the few in his time that were, you know, committed to preaching through books of the Bible uh, in an expository fashion. Um, and so, you know, well, people are still showing up with the pews locked. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to lock the church. And so Sunday after Sunday, they would lock the church <laughs> And uh, it, Simeon would preach from the stairs of the vestibule, uh, sort of in the Whitfield style, with people just standing out, you know, front. And he would just preach from there, and they would pelt him with rotten fruit and stuff. Um, and one time, he actually had a, a locksmith show up to to unlock the door to let him in, and the people changed the lock, um, which apparently was some sort of old law that they couldn't do that. And so Simeon had every right to sue the guy, um, but didn't because he was like, I'm going to win him by my patience. That was his motto. I'm going to win him by my patience. And so he just didn't do it. He just kept preaching from the porch. Um, well, he doesn't do that for a year or two years or five years. It, he preaches from the porch being constantly hated by his people for 12 years. 12 years, he shows up week after week after week with constant opposition from like open vitriol hatred. Um, His own congregants would throw rocks to shatter the windows whenever he would preach inside uh, just to be a nuisance. And he would get all kinds of heckling. And he shows up for 12 years and just keeps, keeps pastoring them and showing up and loving them. And so after 12 years... Uh, he finally has a breakthrough, and they're like, "Well, <laughs> dang! <laughs> like, we can't get rid of this guy. He he just keeps he just keeps showing up. So, you know what? Let's just 
all right, you've proven yourself. You're our pastor now. <laughs> it only took 12 years, but it doesn't stop there. Like this is, this is the crazy. You know, so finally, after 12 hard years uh, of, of labor, um, you know, he's now in his uh, mid to late forties or so. Um, it, when he's, uh, in his, you know, about there, um, he suddenly, uh, a work of the Lord, he succumbs to, to some sort of illness and basically loses his voice, uh, to where preaching is exceedingly difficult to, to where sometimes, you know, he, you know, and this is before microphones, uh, so speaking was just so difficult to where he hardly could sometimes get above a, a whisper, but it took a lot of concentration to, to preach at all. And so he would say, you know, I would preach, but by the end of it, I was, I was, I felt more dead than alive. He wrote in his journal one time, well, he loses his voice for 13 years. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, he, he thinks that, well, you know, what else can happen? You know, I've, I've I've dealt with the opposition of the church for 12 years. I had a a li- very small window where things were going well. I lose my voice and towards the end of him losing his voice, another bout of opposition happens. He's now in his mid 50s. He's been serving the church for over 30 years and now half the church maybe more are right back where they were previously and in opposition. What does Simeon do? What he always did. He showed up Sunday after Sunday, uh, preaching the gospel, being with his people, uh, ministering the word, teaching them the Bible, praying for them and with them, um, you know, equipping the saints for the work of ministry year after year after year, and and finally works through it to to the place that you know his last several years, uh, decade or two of, of ministry um, would end up being some of his most fruitful. Um, Simeon would end up serving the church for 54 years. He would stay at, at Holy Trinity Church, Cambridge, uh, for 54 years, which is amazing. And, um, you know, one, one friend asked him one time after he had been there for almost 50 years, you know, how did you, uh, you know, why, why did you, why did you stick around? Like, why did you, why did you keep showing up? A, A normal, sane person would one with that much opposition probably would never have shown up, would have just been like, no, that's not for me. Um, but especially whenever you faced it for so long, why wouldn't you just say, yeah, you know what? This isn't for me. I'm going to go someplace else. This is his response. My dear brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. When I'm getting through a hedge, if my head and shoulders are safely through, I can bear the pricking of my legs. Let us rejoice in the remembrance that our holy head has surmounted all his suffering and triumphed over death. Let us follow him patiently and we will soon be partakers in his victory. That line, it, my brothers, my, my brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake is, is really just like that picture. Um, you know, and, and what it looks like to, to lead the church in the Christian life. You know, that's not just for pastors to hear that. That's for everybody, but it's especially for pastors. Um, you know, you, you can't mind a, a little suffering for Christ's sake. Um, and it would be that last, you know, couple decades uh, of his ministry that uh, he would actually be the cause of hundreds of missionaries um, directly Hundreds of missionaries would would go to the far reaches of the globe uh, because of his influence and you know his faithful ministry and his mentorship, um, you know all because of of his conviction and his long suffering of I'm going to stay here and I'm gonna I'm gonna be faithful where I'm at and uh, I'm here I'm here until I'm dead kind of thing and he would retire. Uh, in 1836 and two months later, uh, you know, pass into his Lord's rest. Wow. Yeah. I, what I love about that is again, the basis of the endurance. Right. Yeah. And I think we're going to dig more into that here in a minute, but like he's, he loves the people. Yeah. 
he right. wants them to see the Lord's faithfulness. He wants right. them to know who that is, who, right. who the Lord is. And, you know, going back to the whole, like, only Christian at Cambridge thing, right. even, where that's a very lonely experience. Right. His family, even, yeah. is not a Christian. And he's searching, you know, he's going through these books and searching for something. He, I think that it speaks to the reality that maybe we forget being in mm-hmm. the the kind of environment that we're in where there's a church on every corner. Right. Like a faithful Bible-believing church on pretty much every corner right. in Columbia, Tennessee. Right. That there there's something bigger than like ourselves mm, and bigger mm-hmm. than the systems we create. And so Absolutely. I think, you know, in the modern Christian industrial complex, right. you know, we think about pastor pastoral ships right. as, you know, a job, right? Yeah, and it is, exactly. it, it is work. It, yeah, it is yeah. hard work. I'm sure you can attest to that. Absolutely. And we should pay our pastors. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but there is something to that where it's like, you know, someone ending their career with 20 years or 30 years at right. Zion Presbyterian Church right? to a lot of people seems like a crazy thing to ask. Right. You know? Right. Because it's just, it's a little church kind of in the middle of the country. And, yeah. You know, yeah. It, in a very small town and it's the only de- one of its denomination around. Right. And... and it, it can be a lonely experience. Yeah. But the reality is, is that the person calling us to this thing, mm. to our faith, to the role of a pastor, to all of this is bigger than the systems that we've created. Right. And so, and pulling that back around to Charles Simeon, he's, he's experiencing that, right? right. Like right. he's going through this conversion Against all odds. Right. And then he's preaching yeah. against all odds. Right. Over and over again. Right. Because he's rooted in something mm. that's bigger than he is. Yeah. That transcends anything that he could have created or done. Right. And and that's that's amazing. Yeah, you know, and you you hit on a different theme that's interesting about Simeon is is like the loneliness of it all. You know, he's the only Christian mm-hmm. in Cambridge. Um, he's very much kind of on his own. Here's another interesting fact about Simeon: he's a lifelong bachelor. Mm. He never married. Uh, was celibate his whole life. Um, it, and there's something to be said about that. You know, in a world that's like hypersexualized, which by the way, Cambridge in his day was hypersexualized. He, of course, uh, it, like he wrote in his journal one day that he was in the study there at, at Trinity and like there were various things going on that he could hear right outside his window that he had to like, hey, I'm trying to study. And, you know, people were, you know, things were going on like vile things. And, and you know, so he, he's not in like a, a, a super removed um, cultural cu- culture that, that then we're from. Um, you, you know, even in a world uh, of, uh, especially the later part of his life, Victorian era England, which had you know this this view of marriage of you're you're strange if you're not married. Uh, here's this guy who's celibate his his entire life, and that's another kind of I think contributing factor or or a, a theme of his long suffering,ness of, you know, he he never experiences uh, marital companionship. Mm. Um, and part of his rationale for that is, uh, you know, picking up on Paul's language, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I can give so much more to the church in this. And, um, he, you know, really if, um, and this isn't a, a mystery, Simeon, um, really was the model, uh, and kind of the main hero for John Stott, who mm. in so many ways parallels, um, parallel Simeon, but, but especially in, in regards to his, uh, his, his lifelong celibacy. Um, and so there's something else there too, that I, I think is, is an important thread to kind of pull on, um, for, for anybody, but especially people who feel like they're going it alone. Um, n- nobody probably knew loneliness the way that, that Simeon did. 
uh, and yet his rootedness and his steadfastness and long suffering, um, his, his constancy to, to, to turn back to the, the cross is, uh, you know, a crucial aspect of who he was just as a guy, uh, and yeah. as a man. Well, let's, I mean, we've, we've kind of done this throughout the whole conversation, but you've got some points here. Like what are, what are the things that kind of marks of a pastor who is enduring yeah. for the gospel? Yeah. Um, both, you know, I think we can speak historically, obviously, but also like you're a pastor who's enduring for the gospel. Right. Like what, what kind of things do, are you drawing on? And then like, what are, what are some signs as we are preparing to look for a pastor as we're going through that process? Yeah. What are things that like we should be looking for? What, what should, you know, jump out at us yeah. as we're, as we're considering these things? Yeah. So, so one of the first things that I was thinking of, you know, the basis for endurance, um, probably like at the top of my list and this, maybe this is just something that's on my mind a lot recently, but just kind of at the top of the list is, is a confidence in Christ. Um, you know, I was, I was talking to a, a, a pastor friend about another guy that I know who is a professor and, uh, you know, just a guy that I really, really respect. I don't know him personally, but I really, really respect him and his work. Um, but is like just super underrecognized. You know, nobody really knows who this guy is. He's been looked over for so many different things. He doesn't get nearly the respect that he should. And I was like, you know, why? What? And how is he okay with that? And the guy I was talking to, he's like, well, here's why. He's really confident in who he is in Christ. Hmm. He doesn't need the accolades and the prestige of, you know, various degrees or recognition or, you know, endowed chairs of whatever, uh, because he knows who he is in Christ, and that's all that matters to that guy. Um, and so a, a confidence in Christ is just vital for pastors. You'll never make it, um, you know, a, as a pastor, if you don't have this confidence in Christ, um, because, you know, critique will come. And Critique can be really, really good. It's never fun. Um, but when when your identity and your confidence, you know, is rooted in the person of who Christ is, uh, whatever critics kind of come your way, you're able to just take it with as, you know, and say, okay, great. Um, uh, the kind of the leading biography on... Um, on Simeon is uh, a guy by the the name of Hanley Mole M O U L E, um, and he he kind of you know takes two things. Piper wrote a short biography on Simeon too, and leans pretty heavy on this to say that um, Simeon, over the course of all of his the criticism that he faces over his pastoral ministry, grows down in humility and up towards Christ, and you know, that identity, that understanding of, and confidence of who you are in Christ, it always humbles us. Um, and so the way a guy carries himself, you know, they, these are pretty subtle things, but the way a guy carries himself, um, will dictate a lot, uh, as to where they are in regards to this and especially how they deal with criticism. You know, if a guy's able to take, criticism on the chin and go, uh, you know, you said this, this, and this, um, I think you're right on this part and this part. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I ask for forgiveness and I need to repent. Um, and I need to look to Jesus who is my model anyway. Um, you know, and so, you know, there's just a very different, there's a there's an ability to not get caught up on this being about them uh, and being about Christ, uh, and so you know that guy's just going to do do things differently. Um, they're they're going to share the pulpit more. They're going to be okay with somebody else getting the spotlight. Um, they're 
they are fine with uh, other people, um, you know, getting to to lead things. They're they're okay even for um, for other churches thriving. You know, this was a note of of Simeon. He worked diligently, probably learning this from Newton. Um, he, while they were both ministers in the the Church of England, they were very dear friends to tons of independents and Baptists and you know, Presbyterians and everything in in between. Because at the end of the day, they they just wanted to see the 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 gospel go out and um and for Christ to be preached, and that's all they really cared about. So that confidence in Christ will will just look different. But um, secondly, is a reliance on the Spirit. Um, again. When you when if you have a theology, which Simeon did, and so did Newton and tons and tons of others, when you have a theology of the Spirit that I think is biblical, um, that where does real change and real transformation come from? It doesn't come from us. It comes from the Spirit transforming the heart. What happens then is suddenly there's a patient persistence. You're able to show up week after week after week you know, giving yourself, devoting yourself to preaching faithfully scripture, trying to, you know, doing the hard work of, uh, of digging into the text and, and applying it well, while also having the endurance to do it, knowing that if anything is done, it's because the spirit used that, um, to, to change. So there's a, a, a persistent patience and there's, there's a change in pace that comes with that. Uh, you're not frantic. And so there's not these spurts, uh, of energy of I'm going all in and then you burn out and, you know, in like three weeks and then, you know, uh, two years later you've got a sudden spurt again. And then, you know, there's a constancy and a, and a consistent pace as you rely on the spirit, a commitment to prayer, um, you know, which people will see and will notice. Um, you know, if a pastor hasn't asked to pray for you and you've been like, Oh yes, of course. But in your mind, you're like, this is a weird time to pray. Like, you know, you get a phone call from your pastor, pastor, good pastors pray on phone calls, right? It's always awkward. It's always weird, but you do it anyway. Um, because there's a commitment to prayer. Uh, so you'll see it in that regard, but, um, but also praying pastors, most of the time you don't see them praying like, or, or when they're praying, right? They're, they don't make it a spectacle to pray. Uh, but, Good pastors are are committed to uh, to a life that's that's uh, quorum deo before the very face of God, um, and that's a mark of their ministry. And I think you notice it in kind of the way that they do things. But but finally, um, probably the fourth characteristic is uh, is a deep love for the church. Um, you will not stay at a church long if you don't love the church, which just makes sense, right? You. Um, if you're not committed to something, you're not gonna you're not gonna stick around. And so, long suffering only happens when pastors deeply, deeply, deeply love the church and love its people, um, and, and love Jesus. And, and when that, those things, as simple as that sounds, um, when those things come together, uh, faithful, fruitful, not very sexy, but constant ministry happens. And, you know, just kind of with those two examples in mind of Athanasius and and Simeon, kind of them exemplifying these four things, I think anybody could stop and go, yeah, that's somebody that I want to be my pastor. Uh, Somebody that's not about themselves, but is about Jesus. Um, Somebody who, who has a really good pace of they, they keep showing up they keep showing up, they keep showing up. Uh, but somebody that in not only with their words, but with their actions, the fact that they've dealt with my crap for 30 years and they still show up. That's a guy I want to be my pastor. Yeah. I think, man. Yeah. What I love about the, those kind of four things there is how interlocked they are. Oh man. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that, you know, a commitment to prayer is going to lead to a reliance on the Holy Spirit and mm-hmm. confidence in Christ and a love for the church. But yeah. if you're loving the church well, then it's going to push you into prayer. It's going right. to push you into 
a reliance of the Holy Spirit and confidence in Christ. And I love how we can see that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like as a lay person right. in the church, you can feel it right. when that's who your pastor is. Yeah. Totally. And you can tell. Um, and you're not you're not distracted by like the flashy <laughs> right. you know, it's not about yeah. trying to sell the book or trying to oh, sell yeah. the thing. And and I don't think there's anything wrong with pastors writing books. Right. Like I th- I'm I want pastors to write books. Oh, I, yeah. You know, I think that's great. Right. But it's like it's not not using the sermon to sell the book. Right. You know, you're not using conversation, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. Yeah. And you can, you can tell. Um, and as we kind of go forward and we're thinking about what does it mean to have a pastor? What does it mean to, you know, what kind of person do we need yeah. in the pulpit of Zion Presbyterian church or even as people, move away and go to other places and they're thinking like, what kind of church do I want to be a part of? Yeah. I think that this gives us such a good framework for understanding, understanding what the role of a pastor is and Mm -hmm. isn't. And how can we find the place that's like someone who's truly being faithful to what God is doing? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so. thank you, Keaton. Oh, yeah. This is fun. Yeah. We'll be back next week. Next week with another pastor profile. We probably have one, maybe two more Excellent. pastor profiles. And then we'll have uh, a couple couple uh, conclusions to, to this season before we take a little break for Christmas and come out with some new content at the start of the next year, which I'm really excited for. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited for what we're going to be doing. Yeah. Thanks, Keaton. All right.